Hello, and welcome to Design Lab's photo editing walkthrough. Today, I'll be going over some general tips for approaching design projects, giving a little bit of background regarding digital photography, and then diving into a brief Photoshop tutorial. In any design project, you'll want to think about CAT, conceptual, aesthetic, and technical elements. Determine, what is the main idea of this project? Who is the audience for your work? What goals do you have and what messages do you want to convey with this project? You can usually start answering many of these questions by consulting your assignment guidelines or course syllabus. As you begin working, you'll develop an aesthetic for your project. Consider how choices like color, font, and organization of elements support or detract from your project's intended purpose. Ask yourself, are these design choices consistent and coherent? Do they connect with the intended audience? For example, if you're designing an Instagram post about the Green Bay Packers, you'll probably want to use their team colors and avoid design choices that would subtly support the opposing team. Finally, you'll need to consider the technical aspects of your design. Make sure your images are clear and properly scaled and that your text is legible. Importantly, choose the right software to complete your task and learn to use it well. Throughout the rest of this video, I'll reference these conceptual, aesthetic, and technical elements, as well as note places where four key aesthetic principles – contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity – come into play. Now, let's get started with our image editing project. When taking a photo with a camera, you'll need to import that digital file to your computer via your device's memory card. Many of us, however, just use our phones to capture images. In that case, simply email the photo from your phone to yourself. Make sure you choose the option that allows you to send and save the file at its greatest or original size. You don't want to export a smaller, lower quality image. Once you have the image on your computer, make sure to save it somewhere that you can find it again. For example, inside a folder for your current course. We also recommend naming the file so you can search for it easily. For example, I'll title this sample image Calder Flamingo. Let's take a look at this file's properties together. You'll note the size of this file, 2.57 megabytes, isn't too big. But once you start layering in texts and boxes in Photoshop, the file size will increase. Additionally, you can see the dimensions of this photo, about 4,000 by 3,000 pixels. Pixels are the tiny dots of light and color that combine to display an image on a digital screen. The more pixels in an image, the higher the image quality. If you zoom in on a digital image, it starts to get fuzzy and blotchy, or what we call pixelated. That's when you're starting to see individual pixels. What's really cool in this properties menu is that you can see the camera's settings when it took the photo. F-stop, ISO, exposure, focal length, and so on. When I took that photo on my phone, I didn't see any of these settings because they're automatically calibrated in the background. If you're doing photography on your phone, you probably won't see them either but these are the settings you'd find on a fancy digital or film camera. In combination, these settings affect how bright the photo is, if it's in focus, and more. If you were back in ye olden days, once you've taken a photo, that's pretty much it. All those settings would be mostly cemented. But with the power of digital photography, you can change those factors even after you've taken the photo. In this video, one of the things we'll go over is how you can change things like the exposure, which is one of the settings that controls how bright the image is, in Photoshop. While we let the Photoshop program load, let's spend a second on our project concept. There are some things you can add and fix in Photoshop and some you can't. For example, I can't see past the edges of this photo. Maybe I wish I hadn't cut off this part of the sculpture up here. Well, too bad. I'd have to fly back to Chicago to try and get another shot and fix it. So right from the start, when you're taking your photo, stop, take a deep breath, and plan your shot. What are you shooting? Why? What elements are most important? Is there another way you could frame the shot that would work better? Now, let's start using Photoshop. There are two main options to begin your Photoshop project. You can click Open to choose an image and start editing it directly, or you can click Create New to create a new document to work within. Creating a document means you'll get to choose how tall and wide your workspace will be, its resolution, its color mode, and so on. This is the option you want if you're making a poster or a social media banner, something where you want to be able to specify the size. If you already have an image with desirable proportions, then you can just open the image itself and start there. 
The first thing I want you to note is the name of the image and the file extension in this tab up here. As you can see, it's a JPEG because we've opened the image itself and are editing it directly. But what if we mess something up? We want to keep the original file safe so we can start over if we need to. So the first thing you want to do is save as. Make sure to choose PSD, the Photoshop format, from the drop-down menu. This will create a new editable document that we can safely work in, separate from the original image file. Next, let's take a quick tour of the Photoshop interface. Yours will look slightly different than mine since I've moved certain panels around or activated different options. As you get to know Photoshop, you can adjust your workspace to fit your workflow. I'm also working on a PC, so I'll say Control plus the relevant key to indicate the shortcuts I'm using. If you're on a Mac, then all your shortcuts will be the same, except you'll use the Command key instead of Control. On the left side, we've got our toolbar. This is where you'll find things like the Shape tool to make boxes and circles and arrows, the Text tool to add words, the Brush tool to paint or draw on the image, and the Move tool, which allows you to move elements around the document. Hovering over these tools will give you an idea of what they do, as well as tell you the keyboard shortcut to access them. On the right, we've got our Layers panel. Photoshop layers are great. They allow for lots of really flexible editing. With layers, most edits get stacked on top of each other, with the layers on top affecting the layers beneath them, so you can rearrange, hide, delete, and modify them without permanently affecting the image. Currently, our base image is locked to prevent unwanted edits. We're going to unlock it by clicking the padlock icon so we can edit it as much as we want. Let's start by adding some adjustment layers. These can be found at the bottom of the layer panel inside the half moon button. Clicking any of these options will produce a new layer on top of our old one. Adjustment layers are used to make images brighter or darker, change the color composition, add filters, and more. Since they're layers, this means they're separate from the original image and editable. For example, maybe you want your image to be black and white. Bam, there you go. Click that layer and the image is now in black and white. If desired, you can further adjust the layer qualities in the properties panel. If you realize, eh, I don't actually want this to be in black and white, then you can just delete the layer by selecting it and hitting the delete button on your keyboard or by dragging the layer into the little trash icon. Note, make sure you've clicked on the layer itself, not this box, which is the layer mask used to make edits inside of a layer. Additionally, if you make a mistake, the keyboard shortcut Ctrl Z will undo your previous action, or you can go up to the top menu and click Edit Undo. Now, let's talk about those camera settings we mentioned earlier. For example, let's add the exposure adjustment layer. When I took this image, the exposure, remember the amount of light led into the photo, translating roughly into the brightness, the exposure was uh, acceptable, but not great. The background buildings look alright, but the sculpture itself is kind of dark, so we can use the exposure layer to change the brightness. This can involve a subtle edit, like this, or we can use it to create a super stylized effect, like this. For example, let's crank up this exposure and also add a hue saturation layer. Let's turn that saturation, that is the intensity of a color, up really high. Now we've got ourselves a funky kind of image. You'll also start to note that when we turn these settings up really high like this, we get more and more digital noise. Digital noise is this grainy or pixelated stuff here. This happens because there's a limit to how much data the digital image holds. Remember we mentioned pixels earlier? This image is made of a limited number of pixels because it's a raster image. Raster images are not infinitely scalable. That is, if you blow them up, they get blurry and pixelated. Meanwhile, there are also vector images, which are things created inside editing software that are infinitely scalable. This means you could zoom in on them forever and they'd never get pixelated. Photography is pretty much always going to be raster, while things like boxes and text that you add in Photoshop may be vector-based. For example, let's add a shape. Click the Shape tool and hold down to choose your desired shape. Then, click and drag out on the shape to the desired width and height. You can change the fill color or the outline, otherwise known as the stroke, in this menu up here. Let's also add some text. Click the T for text tool, click on your image, and start typing.
you can adjust the font, text size, and more in the Properties panel. And move the text around by returning to the Move tool. This is also a good time to remember to save your file. You can choose File, Save, or simply use the keyboard shortcut Ctrl-S. Try to remember to save your image every few minutes so you don't lose any of your work. Now, as you start adding these multiple elements to your image, you'll want to check your crap. Contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. Regarding contrast, is everything legible? Do any parts blend into each other? Is it clear what part of the visual or textual information is the most important? For example here, can I read this light text on top of this bright background? Let's fix that. Also consider repetition. You can copy any of these layers either by keying Ctrl C, Ctrl V, or right clicking on the layer and choosing Duplicate Layer. This means your shapes and text will have the same properties. This is a good place to start as it will help your design maintain a consistent aesthetic. Just copy one good effective element and modify it slightly. For example, you could add a subtitle here in the same font and color, but add a slightly smaller font size and in italics. As you organize these elements, make sure they're aligned. This is important for conceptual and aesthetic reasons. If an element is out of alignment, viewers may be distracted and not absorb the message as quickly or as efficiently. It's also just super frustrating to look at something that's just a little bit off. On a similar note, remember the role of proximity. If pieces of information are close together, we associate them in our minds. If they're visually separate, then they're often absorbed as conceptually separate. For example, it makes sense to have a subtitle near the title, but you might list something like the artist or the image source further away. Last but not least, you can combine and merge more than one image. The easiest way to do this is to simply drag and drop an additional image into your first one. For example, maybe I want to add a photo of the artist Alexander Calder to this composition. There are many different ways to edit images within images, but I'm partial to the quick selection tool. Click the tool or use the shortcut W. If I want to get rid of this background, I can simply select the subject and hide everything else. Click over the subject until the black and white marquee lines contain everything you want, then go to the layer panel and click the layer mask button. This will hide everything outside the selection. By using this layer mask, we don't delete the background, we just hide it, so we can always go back and fine tune it if we make a mistake. Finally, when you're done editing your image, you should export it. Unless your instructor asks for a Photoshop document or other specific format, you will always want to export your work as an image file. Image files such as JPEGs and PNGs are smaller and easier to attach and share and open online than Photoshop files are. So to export your image properly, go to File, Export, and Export As to determine the dimensions of your final image and save it. I recommend saving your final product in the same place as you saved your original image so you can easily find it when you go to turn your final project in. All right, that's all for now. We at Design Lab hope you have fun as you start editing images. If you want to find more high quality design resources, you can consult the Design Lab website to peruse our materials, make an appointment, or chat with us. If you want more assistance with the technical side of photo editing, you should visit Software Training for Students. You can also use search engines to find tutorials if you have a specific effect in mind. And of course, you can just play around with the software yourself. Experiment with layers, tools, filters, and more to see all the cool things you can do with Photoshop.